Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Stick to Sports. I'm Luke Owens. And I'm Matt Watling. Today, a legend retires, the Big Ten is back, and of course, the Jets still sting. Roll it. In what was supposed to be the biggest game of Sunday, the Tampa Bay Bucks dismantled the Green Bay Packers 38-10, to despite getting out to a 10 to nothing lead. Aaron Rodgers threw two interceptions, including a pick six. Meanwhile, Tom Brady only threw for 166 yards, while the run game was on display, totaling 158 yards. Of course, the Bucks would come away with a 38-10 to win. And Matt, did this game tell us more about the Packers or the Buccaneers? I think it really speaks to the, the defense of both teams, because we know for Aaron Rodgers, he's not going to complete 16 of his passes if he's throwing 35 of them. He's bad in that. He's also not two interceptions bad. And to me, what really stood out was the Tampa Bay defense. They really, really impressed me. Both them and the offense for the Buccaneers kind of had a slow start to the season. But right now, they're 4-2 and two in a wide-open NFC South with their biggest competitors really seem to be the Carolina Panthers, which is, is crazy. You would never have thought that at the start of the season. And also, the NFC in general is really wide open as well, primed for Tom Brady to possibly win another championship. Don't count out the Saints just yet, as much as Drew Brees has looked a little bit watched. But the Bucs do look great. I loved what I saw from them, especially getting Rob Gronkowski involved in the offense. Five catches for 78 yards and a touchdown. Even with Mike Evans only getting one catch for 10 yards, I think that speaks volumes about the depth of this Buccaneers offense. We haven't seen Tom Brady with this many weapons since really his early days in New England. So for him to be able to spread the ball around, get Gronk involved, and have that run game, really like what I saw from Tampa Bay on Sunday. Yeah, and for the Green Bay Packers, one word for you guys, as Aaron Rodgers likes to say, relax. It's only one loss. You're going to have a couple of those. And speaking of teams that are pretty much already in full panic mode, the New York Jets are now the only team in the NFL without a win after the Giants and Falcons got their first wins of the season. The, the Jets end up losing to the Dolphins 24 nothing, Luke. And what else is there to say about this team? They're just so bad. Well, the only thing I can say is, will they ever win a game this year? Because when I look at that schedule, maybe the Dolphins – Come second time around, you get Sam Donald back, you hope. But, I mean, it's been absolutely brutal. And was Greg Williams right? Is this offense really the reason why the defense can't, I mean, get off the field? 24 points allowed. They didn't play really all that terribly, I thought. The Dolphins were given good field possession every single time. And, I mean, it's just a train wreck in New York right now. This was a team in the Jets that won the turnover battle, had the ball for three more minutes, and had ran more plays than the Dolphins and still lost by 24. It was so ridiculous. And, Luke, you bring up – Greg Williams' comments when he pretty much said, look, our points per game allowed is pretty bad, but it's not on us, basically saying the offense has been hurting the defense. And, the, and Adam Gates was not happy about the comments. He said it publicly. And this is how he responded. His own defensive coordinator called him out, and he completely flopped. Whether it's the offense or whether it's the, the players or the scheme itself, the entire offense was a complete failure. And I'm really scared for the Jets that there might be a mutiny or a culture problem if Gates isn't fired as soon as possible. This is how bad it's gotten. Yeah, it seems like he's lost the locker room. So we'll see, you know, how long that kind of string is for Adam Gase there in New York. But we'll shift things over to the broadcasting world, where in a heartfelt video essay on Monday, legendary hockey broadcaster Doc Emmerich announced his retirement at the age of 74. Emmerich was the voice of NBC Hockey for 15 years and the New Jersey Devils for 21 years before that. You know, one of the most loved people in the industry. It'll be really weird to hear a Stanley Cup champion crowned without the legendary Doc Emmerich. And Luke, when you, when you bring that up, he might be the most iconic broadcaster when it comes to being associated with one specific sport. You know, there's a lot of voices for the NFL. There's a lot for the MLB. Basketball is a couple. But there's really only one for hockey, and that's Doc Emmerich. And that goes to show how much he's helped kind of grow this game, being the one big voice in hockey. And it's going to be so awkward or really just weird not hearing his voice in some of those big name games, like you said, Luke, and, and also just – Everyone always talks about him as such an incredible person. After the press conference on Monday he, that he had had to host for his retirement, he told anyone, he said, look, I ran so long that anyone that has questions that didn't get answered, send them to NBC and I'll answer them throughout the week. Just a really classy guy. Yeah, so many great stories coming up. Obviously, a guy that, you know, overcame cancer, all these other things. And, and one thing that stood out to me is that he loves doing interviews, especially with young high school broadcasters. Like for him to take the time out of the day to talk to, you know, people only in high school is just – so awesome, a testament to his character. He definitely will be missed both in the booth and out of it. 
And now moving to the college hockey route here in Division Three, the SUNYAC shocked its players, coaches, and fans as it announced the cancellation of the winter season just two weeks after announcing drafted schedules. Luke, the conference says it made the decision out of abundance of caution, but it just really stings for SUNYAC fans. It does for fans, for players, and obviously for media. I, I, I sound very selfish, you know, when, when we say, you know, it feel for the media, but I mean, it is a big thing here in Oswego and especially covering hockey games. My, my heart goes out for, for you, for other seniors that won't be able to, to broadcast that second semester. It, it, it stings. Obviously, it's out of precaution, but for the players as well, missing the semester, I mean, it, it, it's really heartbreaking to, to hear. Yeah, I, I feel terrible for all the players and families. I mean, some of the seniors, they might never play again. And to have this happen to them, you, you saw it happen last year with the tournament. At least they got their final season for some of them. For what could be the, the fall sports and now the winter sports, they might never get that closure, which is awful. And then, again, we'll go back to it. For us, selfishly, this really sucks. I mean, both of us spend three years covering the teams, and it just gets ripped out from under us, from the players and their families, and it's just gut-wrenching. It, it hurts so much that we can't cover these teams because talking to uh, Whitelaw, the assistant coach for the hockey team, he liked the team. You lose 13 seniors, but he still really liked this team, and it's a shame they never really can come together and see what they could do for them. Yeah, we'll see if the SUNYAC releases, you know, what they'll, what they'll eventually come to because they made the schedule. They kind of backtracked a little bit. So some more news to come out there. But we're going to take a quick break here on Stick to Sports. Up next, we'll dive into the World Series matchup only on WTOP 10. Welcome back to Stick to Sports. Heading into big talk for this week, we start with the start of the end of baseball, the World Series will start this week featuring the Tampa Bay Rays and the L.A. Dodgers. There's been a lot of talk about the legitimacy of championships this year, especially, Matt. And with baseball having that short season, you know, it's the two best teams in baseball, which I think really helps the cause. But do you see this championship in this year as legitimate? I think it certainly is. We saw what happened in the NBA and the NHL where people were making the argument that it's harder to play in a bubble. And while baseball doesn't have that bubble atmosphere, you still got the two best teams from each league. And the Dodgers were a team that you expected to make it to the World Series. The Rays, maybe you didn't expect it, but it certainly wasn't a shock. They were definitely a, a top five team in the AL going into this season. And they're legit. They're a really good team. So to, to anyone saying that it wouldn't be legitimate anymore is it's such an old kind of wash narrative that we heard again come up with LeBron winning his championship and not having to face the tougher teams, even though the Clippers lost in the second round. Like, all yeah. these championships have been really good. I know. I think some of the takes is, like, you know, it's a 60-game season. You know, baseball is meant to be 162. It's a grind of who can make it to the finish line. But look at the grind of this schedule. I mean, they played 60 games, and they had all these double headers and they had all these moving pieces, moving games around, stuff like that, all the adversity they had to go through. I mean, that just is, is a testament to these players to, to make it this far. And then adding to that, to that grind – the normal playoffs aren't a grind because you're getting a day off every two games or so on average with the travel time in this, in this specific season, you didn't, you played from the wild card through the AL, the championship series with pretty much no days off, maybe one or two at between series. And that to me speaks volumes at how hard this one was to win. There was one really interesting article. I think it was in the athletic. I'm not quite sure that pretty much said the Rays benefit from the shortened season because other teams couldn't build up their starters to seven plus innings, only getting 10 or 12 starts. And then, on the flip side, the Rays, their, their starters, a little bit injury prone, at least with Blake Snell. So for him to limit his innings of work actually helped him and also the Rays because of their, their stronger bullpen. And speaking of the Rays bullpen, one of the best matchups in the series will be that pitching staff of the Rays against a lethal Dodgers offense featuring Cody Bellinger, Mookie Betts, Corey Seager, the list goes on and on. And on the other hand, the Rays feature the league's third best pitching staff. Matt, who do you think has the upper hand in this matchup? It's interesting to look at because you look at the Rays pitching. They allow just three and a half runs per game this postseason, which is, is crazy to me. I mean, they shut down the Yankees in game five, just three hits in that game for the Yankees, one run. But that was also a team that was battling injuries. You know, Judge wasn't 100%, or if he was, he didn't get the reps in the regular season that kind of got him to his, his peak or his prime. But when I look at the Dodgers, they're completely healthy, and they've just been on another level. And well, you know, you look at them, they won the championship series with Mookie Betts hitting 269, Cody Bellinger hitting 200. That's impressive. And I think that really carries over for a Dodgers team that's almost figured out how to win with low scoring. Yeah. And Corey Seager has been so impressive to me for the Dodgers. He's going to get a big paycheck next offseason. Uh, five home runs for him in that series. Like you mentioned, even their big stars, 
uh, not even contributing as much as we're accustomed to seeing. And don't forget, Dodgers had the best regular season ERA. So their pitching staff, not too shabby either. And of course, these teams enter the World Series under di different circumstances. The Rays nearly blew a 3 0 lead to Houston while the Dodgers came back from a 3 1 deficit against the Braves. So, Matt, you know, who do you like in this series and what do you see as some of the, the key factors? I think I'm going to roll with the Dodgers. I think it's, I'll go Dodgers in six. I think it's very similar to the Tampa Bay Lightning where there's not a lot of fans in the stands. I think Kershaw's going to get off out of the gifts off the schneid. Mookie's been turning it on the last couple of games. He was five of 12 in the last three games of the, of the NLCS. And I think those are the big things that are going to really pre uh, pump this team up a little bit. Yeah, I like the Dodgers too. I think it's going to be a really good series though. I, I would never count out the Rays. They're a fantastic team. They're a fantastic organization. One guy I really circle for the Rays is Charlie Morton. He's been fantastic this postseason. Uh, one uh, 15.2 innings pitched, 0.57 ERA for him this postseason. He loves pitching in those big games. He loves the big moments. We know Snell and Glass now are going to be solid, even though Glass now struggled at times this this postseason. But I look to to Charlie Morton to be that guy for them. You know, going forward, I think they make this a seven game series. But I do like the Dodgers to come out on top, and I'd really like to see Clayton Kershaw finally get that championship. And one quick note is in Game Two specifically. It might be a big issue. That's the Wednesday game where Walker Bueller, if he pitches, it'll be on three days rest. And the other starters, Julio Urias, Dustin May, and Tony Gonsolin, they all pitch Sunday. So not a lot of rest for game two, which is certainly a big issue for this team. Yeah, we'll see if that raised pitching depth kind of comes to play uh, throughout the series. And now, look, moving to college football, it really appears as if there's two teams that have separated themselves from the rest of the field. It's Clemson and Alabama. They're on an absolute mission this season, combining for a 9-0 record. And, Luke, a point differential of 261 or plus 261. Are there, there are some other teams in college football like Notre Dame and Oklahoma State, but what makes these two teams specifically so special in Clemson and Alabama? One thing that I love is every year people talk about the, the adversity in college football, but it's Clemson and Alabama and then everyone else once again. And one thing I love about both these teams, but Clemson specifically, Bama struggle a little bit on this side of the ball, but the defenses are very underrated. Obviously, Clemson plays in the ACC and – you know, they only beat, you know, Georgia Tech and, and teams like that so far. But at the same time, they're so well coached. I mean, Dabo Sweeney, uh, Nick Saban, I love those two guys for both of these programs. They keep just a steady route of recruits. I mean, Clemson's had so many guys go pro. Alabama has lost so many guys every single year, and yet they turn it over and have great re recruiting classes. And I don't want to say that the SEC is high and mighty because they have some really bad teams in there as well. But one thing that's underrated is the defenses. And then, of course, Trevor Lawrence for Clemson is just unbelievable. Right, and moving over to that SEC, Luke, since Kirby Smart took over in 2016 for the Georgia Bulldogs, they've seen, Al they've seen Alabama come from behind in three straight games, and, and Bama end up winning them, including last week, uh, Bama win 63-48 after trailing by four at halftime. We kind of saw Georgia manage to reach the college football playoffs in 2018 after losing to Alabama earlier in that season. Luke, is there any chance they could do it again? There's definitely a chance they're going to have to win their division. They're going to have to beat Alabama in the SEC championship. I mean, it's, it's simple as that. You don't lose twice to Alabama and make the college football playoffs. I don't really trust Stenson Bennett, their freshman quarterback. I think losing Jamie Newman to, to the opt-out was a big loss for them. It just depends who wins Georgia, Florida, because one of those two teams could win, beat Bama, and get in. But it's going to be easier said than done, of course. One thing that was so interesting to me is looking at the college football uh, playoff chances, according to ESPN, Georgia's got a 28% chance, which is fifth among all teams, only behind Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, and Wisconsin. And to me, that's interesting because Ohio State and Wisconsin, obviously both in the Big Ten, one of those teams probably won't make it. So are they setting up a chance where, where Georgia's that fourth team in, even though they've got a, a loss? And for Alabama, they might not win the conference championship, and they could still get in. Yeah, I think, it, I think there's a definite possibility. I mean, the SEC starting early, you know, they've seen them play more. So I could definitely see a two SEC college football playoff. Now, some of the other teams trying to join the college football playoffs will be teams like Ohio State and, you know, some other Big Ten schools we, we mentioned, like Wisconsin. They're starting their seasons this weekend. And kind of looking at the college football playoff as a whole, Luke, I'm really interested to see how the committee is going to evaluate those fringe teams, whether it be Ohio State or another Big 12 school or rolling with an SEC team. I think the best case for the Big Ten would be Ohio State running the field, winning the Big Ten championship. I think that gets them in because Justin Fields is incredible. He's must-watch TV. They'd love to have him in that playoff. But if things get messy, if Ohio State loses a game or two, that's when it gets interesting because I don't know how valuable, you know, a two-loss Wisconsin team is if they win the Big Ten championship or a scenario like that. So really interesting to see how it plays out if Ohio State loses either in the regular season or the Big Ten because we're not seeing as many games from the Big Ten. So every game really does matter. And same with the Pac-12, which I don't even see a Pac-12 team getting in this year. Even if they run the table, they might not get that chance. And 
you know, I, I look at this, the college football playoff scenario, and I hate when two teams from the same conference get in, but I keep talking myself into Georgia getting it if they win this SEC title game. I mean, Big 12, I don't necessarily see a team getting, getting in. Same with the Pac-12, and that leaves th- one extra spot after Ohio State, Bama, and Clemson. Yeah, you'd need Oklahoma State to be run the table, win the Big 12. I don't think they do that. So I'm right there with you. I think we see two SEC and hopefully Ohio State for the Big 10. And we've got to take a quick break here on Stick to Sports. When we come back, Luke will be joined by Zach Malamud for more on some of the craziest sport- stories in sports. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Stick to Sports. Welcome back to Stick to Sports. Joining me now is Zach Malamud as Matt mentioned before the break, and Zach, what stories do you have for us this week? After the Miami Dolphins' 24 to nothing win over the New York Jets, rookie quarterback Tua Tagovailoa was seen sitting on the field post-game after his NFL debut. The former Alabama quarterback stepped on the field for the first time since the scare of a career-ending hip injury nearly one year ago, but the ovation he received made the moment even more special. First of all, great job on the pronunciation. That, that, that's a tough one with, with Tua. And I love, the, I love the ovation. I love Ryan Fitzpatrick getting in the mix, cheering him on. I love that out of a veteran quarterback who, you know, is kind of – he's going to be maybe not on his way out this year, but at some point Tua will be taking that job. So I, I love this moment for Tua. And actually after the game, he said that he, was, he FaceTimed his parents uh, on the field as well. So really special moment for Tua. And, of course, the Dolphins looking good this year. Yeah, and Tua going through that scare last year at Alabama and still deciding to go into the NFL draft, and it was a huge decision, and it's really going to pay off, it looks like, in the end for Tua Tagovailoa. So coming back after that scare, definitely a huge moment making his NFL debut. Yeah, I'm really excited to see, you know, how long before the Dolphins start him because they look good. They're in a playoff spot right now, but uh, we'll see because I really want to see him get a full game in. Yeah, and we'll move over to our next topic, and we talk about the big moments and players coming up clutch, but Julio Urias, a 24-year-old lefty, deserves all the credit he can get after the Dodgers win in Game 7. Urias became only the second reliever to close out a winner-take-all game with at least three no-hit innings. I love this. I love Urias. I love everything about him, the goggles, the kind of funky delivery from the lefty, the high pants. And I mean, just a baller, three innings turned in. And that's a tough Braves lineup to maneuver, especially as a lefty, that top of the order is tough. And for him to get through those nine outs was so big for the Dodgers. They don't have to pitch Kershaw. They're able to save him for game one. And just a really gutsy performance from the rookie. Yeah, and you really look at the Dodgers, there could have been three MVPs for the Dodgers in the NLCS. Corey Seager, of course, got the MVP award. But Mookie Betts with a bunch of web gems and then Julio Urias closing it out in game seven, three no-hit innings. The Dodgers are getting people from everywhere, their bullpen or even their lineup to help them move on. Yeah, I love it. As you mentioned, Mookie Betts, how spectacular was he with those robbing home runs, making every catch. I I love to see him finally out of the Red Sox uniform and into that Dodgers blue because I can finally root for him. And finally, Giants quarterback Daniel Jones hit almost 21 miles per hour in his 49-yard run versus the Washington football team, the fastest in his young career. But Jones now has three of the top seven quarterback speeds recorded this season. The other four speeds are Lamar Jackson. After the game Sunday, Darius Slayton called him Daniel Jackson to the media. I love this so much. I mean... When you look at Daniel Jones, you don't think uh, speed, but I mean, clearly he has it. He's up there with him and Lamar Jackson in a world of their own and really nifty little play. He even faked out the cameraman with that read option. So I love this out of Daniel Jones. Giants get their first win, of course, and Jones running all over that Washington defense. Yeah, and like you said, when you look at a quarterback like Daniel Jones, you don't think athleticism and speed. So Daniel Jones pulling out that read option. Yeah, the Washington football team's defense needs some work. So Daniel Jones, definitely a great run there. And the Giants getting their first win of the season. Yeah, maybe Daniel Jones is a little bit more than Eli Manning when it comes to at least running the ball. So uh, that'll be fun to watch over there in Giants country. We'll take a quick break here on Sick to Sports. Thanks once again to Zach for his segment. When we come back, Matt and I pre- preview our best bets and what to watch for. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Stick to Sports on WTOP Time. Welcome back.
Welcome back to Stick to Sports. We now jump into our what to watch for, looking forward to things going on in the sports world in the coming days. And my must-watch game this weekend come from the Big Ten. That's right. It's back. I have my eyes on Michigan traveling to Minnesota. The Wolverines were 9-4 and four last year, losing, losing basically every big, big game they had, per usual. And the Gophers, meanwhile, surprised some people going 11-2 and two and just barely missing the conference championship game. In the 104th meeting between the two schools, don't sleep on P.J. Fleck and the Gophers. And, of course, row that boat, baby. Yeah, and moving to the pros, Luke, I've got a 1 p.m. matchup on Sunday between the 5-0 Steelers and the 5-0 Tennessee Titans. Now, this is a sneaky good matchup, one with one-seed implications when you kind of consider – some might even forget that the Bills, Ravens, and Chiefs all have at least one loss. The Bills obviously losing on Monday night. And – Personally, I don't see Pittsburgh grabbing that one seat, even if they improve to 6-0. and For me, Big Ben's just a, a tad too old, and we could see him start to regress as the season rolls along. Now, for Tennessee, a win for them would be huge. They've been kind of compared to the Jacksonville Jaguars from a few years ago, the, the one-hit wonders that are led by really strong defenses and not much else. But this season, to me, proves that wrong. Ryan Tannehill can be an actual quarterback in the NFL. The defense is still well-coached, physical, and the team as a whole is really dynamic. I mean, Derrick Henry is still being able to – run the ball fairly well. He hasn't declined or regressed a little bit at all. And this is a really exciting team and exciting to see this matchup between two undefeated teams in the AFC. Yeah, I'm excited for that. And I think Ryan Tannehill is legit, as you said. And along with our what to watch for, we also have our best bets. I am off to an absolutely awful 0-2 start on the show. We had Kentucky blowing out Tennessee last week. I picked Tennessee. And then I had Atlanta, the future, to win the NL. So close. They had a 3-1 lead, but they ended up blowing that. So I need a bounce back. My lock of the century guaranteed hit is over 61 points in the Clemson-Syracuse football game. Syracuse's defense is awful. They just got carved up by Liberty, who just became an FBS program two years ago. Well, Clemson, they just dropped 73 points on Georgia Tech, playing a drive with a punter at quarterback. So Clemson, you know, they might score, you know, 51, 56 themselves. So if Syracuse can score about 10, you're good to go. Clemson might drop a 70-burger in this one. So I like the over in that Syracuse-Clemson game. Yeah, Luke, I was going to say, Clemson might hit the over all by themselves. This is a really oh, yeah. low number. <laughs> kind of shockingly low. And I th- you missed the point of this segment, Luke. The, the trick here is to pick games that will either A, get canceled, so shout out the, the Gators from last week, or B, are way too far in the future for people to remember. But I'd like to just say, for the record, I have the Titans winning the AFC South at plus 100 when the Colts were favorites, and now they're a game and a half up on those said Colts. So just something to point out there. But – <laughs> looking into this week, give me the Ohio State Nebraska over at 65 and a half points. Something we saw with the NFL was that scoring was really significantly up uh, the first few weeks of the season due to a lack of practice time. And in the Big Ten, Big Ten, I expect something somewhat similar here. Ohio State typically dominant. They beat Nebraska by 30 plus points per game over the last couple of seasons. And it could be more of the same. The sheer amount of points Ohio State scores could be 50 plus, which is really bodes well for the over. So we'll find out if Matt can pick next week. But that's all the time we have on this episode of Stick to Sports. Be sure to tune in next week right here on WTOP 10.